Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this, uh, our series of lectures uh, in the philosophy of science in economics. Uh, I know that uh, by now we have covered a number of things. Uh, we started with the general understanding of what philosophy is all about. Uh, we went through uh, the concepts of ontology, we went through concepts of epistemology, and we went through uh, concepts of metaphysics. And um, uh, if you recall, around that time, I did uh, take you through a number of very important and yet interesting uh, concepts uh, in the philosophy of science. Um, uh, and I told you that um, uh, the philosophy of science that we are undertaking in this course uh, is related to uh, economics. In other words, we are dealing with the philosophy of science uh, in economics. Uh, so all those aspects were covered, if you recall. Uh, we went through the nature of understanding. And uh, of course, at that uh, level, we are concerned with knowledge. Uh, then from there, we proceeded and uh, continued with the reality, uh, because we had to understand what reality is all about. And then we went through the uh, 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 aspect of constructing reality out there. So uh, construction of the world was yet another topic that uh, we covered. And then from there we proceeded and looked at the history and relevance of philosophy of science in economics, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, at that time, uh, we stopped uh, at a level uh, where I gave you a number of resource uh, books that you are supposed to read. And I remember asking you to go and read uh, the book uh, Conjectures and Refutations uh, by Karl Popper. And I hope you had an opportunity to read that book, ladies and gentlemen. I asked you to read The Philosophy and uh, Methodology of Economics. I asked you to read The Handbook of Economic Methodology. I asked you to read uh, a Philosophy of Economics, an anthology. Uh, and that is really uh, a book that is pub published by Cambridge University Press. And uh, I asked you to read uh, another book uh, which is the Dismo Queen uh, of the Social Sciences, uh, in fact, and fiction in economics. Uh, and that book deals with realism, uh, models, and social construction, ladies and gentlemen. Now, those are not the only books that I asked you to read. I also told you that you needed to read uh, the book that is authored by Kuhn in 1962, which is actually the structure of scientific revolution. Uh, and I also asked you to read the works of Lakatos, 1970, uh, falsification and the methodology of scientific research program. And of course, in that series of uh, Lakatos's uh, publications, I asked you also to read the methodology of scientific research programs and then, uh, of course, criticism and the growth of knowledge. And all those are very important and useful books, ladies and gentlemen, that you are supposed to read uh, so that you gain a deeper understanding of the subject. Now, today, uh, which is actually our lecture seven, ladies and gentlemen, and this is the seventh meeting, uh, I continue uh, uh, exploring uh, the aspects uh, in the philosophy of science and economics. So what do you may call philosophy of economics? And uh, uh, this time I want you to add another yet important book that you must read, uh, which is uh, a book published by Austin, 1962, and that is How to Do Things with Words, uh, and that is uh, published by Harvard University Press. Uh, I also want you to read uh, the book by I Do Not, uh, 2008, uh, and also the works of Basca. Uh, and uh, of course, there, the books relate to what we call the invisible hand uh, in economics, and is published by Routledge. And of course, a realistic theory of science, 
so that book is very important and you must probably read that book. You also need to read uh, the works of Kairanas, uh, the character and logical method of political economy. Uh, not forgetting the works of Friedman. Uh, I hope you have had an opportunity to read uh, Bola 1979, a critique of Friedman's uh, critics, and that is really uh, a journal article published uh, in the Journal of Economic Literature, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the list is quite long. I don't think I can give you all the books uh, today uh, because uh, the books are too many. But in the same process, do not forget to read uh, the book written by Mackey, 1996, uh, Scientific Realism and Some Peculiarities of Economics. And that is in realism and anti-realism in the philosophy of science. Uh, then you'll have these as journal articles. And then you can always uh, read and possibly you'll be able to understand uh, the concepts that we are dealing with and how important uh, these aspects are. Don't forget Silos, uh, Scientific Realism and How Science Tracks Truth. And this is published by, uh, by London, Rutridge, actually, London, 1999. Ladies and gentlemen, today I want to handle yet an important and very interesting uh, concept or topic, uh, which I'll call realism and anti-realism about economics. So that is what we are covering today in this lecture uh, seven, and uh, we shall continue with the same in lecture eight and lecture nine. We hope to have around three lectures about the same concept, ladies and gentlemen. Now, just to give you a structure of how we are going to uh, discuss this concept, uh, we, I'll give you an introduction uh, to the concept of realism and anti-realism uh, about economics. Uh, I'll take you through uh, scientific realism in a conventional philosophy of science. Uh, then we shall continue with the ingredients of a minimal scientific realism. And thereafter, we shall handle another yet important aspect of realism, uh, which is common sensibles and their modifications in economic modeling. So there we, we deal with the issues of common sense and uh, how do we then model uh, common sense. And then we shall proceed with the social construction. Uh, social construction uh, is an important aspect that we need to understand in realism and anti-realism about economics. And thereafter, ladies and gentlemen, I will give you a conclusion uh, of our discussion. So why don't we then start? Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I've always told you, uh, and I continue to uh, make similar statements and reference to the earlier discussions that we have had, economics is a controversial scientific discipline. And uh, you need to really be aware of that. Uh, there, is, uh, uh, there are controversies. Uh, in the discipline of economics, it's a controversial scientific discipline. And um, uh, one of the traditional issues that has kept economics and their critics busy uh, is about whether uh, economic theories and models are about anything real at all. So the question of reality uh, seems to come to the fore at any given discussion uh, when the discipline of economics uh, crops up. Now, the critics of economics have argued that uh, economic models are based on assumptions that are so utterly unrealistic and of course, you know how we construct knowledge in economics. We always make assumptions. And that is very true. And um, there's a general belief that if you are going to model or, or come up with a, a model of behavior and actions based on assumptions, then those models that you have come up with uh, become purely fictional. And they have nothing informative to say about the real world. And those are the critics uh, of economics, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, those critics also claim that, um, uh, 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 that um, uh, there are uh, earlier scholars in the area of economics who have actually gone ahead uh, to promote the 
anti-realist instrumentalism, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, they actually cite out people uh, like uh, Milton Friedman in 1953. And, and they say that, you know, what he came up with and his writings and so forth, uh, that uh, he, he, he really promoted that element of anti-realist instrumentalism. And of course, as you can see, such a kind of thinking uh, justifies unrealistic models, and uh, that's why you've got so many people coming up and uh, critiquing uh, uh, the things that we do in economics. Now, some people argue that um, uh, what is the case in the economy and uh, the way economics uh, relates to, uh, to it are socially constructed so that there is no economics independent way uh, uh, the world works or truth uh, can be construed about uh, such things, ladies and gentlemen. So that is the kind of thinking uh, that some people have. So they argue that uh, you can't really talk about the economy and you can't, you can't talk about the way economics relates to economy uh, without really bearing in mind the social construction of reality in an economy uh, because you cannot dwell with the, that element of social construction. Uh, so knowledge that we pick at the end of the day is socially constructed and therefore uh, they continue to argue that economics uh, probably promotes uh, certain models and uh, possibly theories uh, which do not capture reality at all, ladies and gentlemen. Now, on both of these pictures that I've just given you, ladies and gentlemen, uh, realism would seem to have um, uh, little to do with economics. Uh, so that's why uh, the, the, you have those arguments. So these pictures are too simplistic. And of course, as you know very well, ladies and gentlemen, in economics, uh, realism is very important. There is more realism in and about economics uh, than uh, first would appear. Now, to see this requires not just looking more closely, but also adjusting one's conception of scientific realism, ladies and gentlemen. So as I promised you in this lecture, we continue with our series of discussions and, of course, uh, bring out the issues of realism and anti-realism in economics, ladies and gentlemen. Now, of course, uh, we need to also have a critical stance uh, on much of what economists themselves and other commentators have claimed. Now, historically, ladies and gentlemen, uh, there is much wisdom available in the philosophical self-image of the discipline of economics. And we need to understand that very well, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, let's now uh, delve into scientific realism, ladies and gentlemen, in the conventional philosophy of science. Now, conventional versions of scientific realism uh, celebrate science for its achievements uh, in penetrating into the secrets of nature and trying to manipulate uh, nature. So how do you penetrate? And that's conventional wisdom conventional versions of scientific realism, right? They tend to view uh, science and even celebrate science uh, for that important achievement of getting and penetrating into the secrets of nature and trying to manipulate that nature. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, uh, indeed, uh, much of the philosophy of science literature on scientific realism seems tailored for discussing issues around successful physical sciences. And therefore, economics uh, does not deal with physical subject matter, you know that very well. So economics is, uh, uh, as a discipline, does not deal with physical subject matter, but economics does obviously exhibit uh, the predictive and technological success usually attributed to the physical sciences. So you see that what goes into the development of technology, right, and the predictions uh, that come up are probably, uh, again, 
uh, aspects that are contributed to by economics. So economics has a very huge role to play uh, in uh, coming up with uh, those technological advances, technological successes, uh, which are usually attributed to the physical sciences. And of course, we also provide the predictive um, uh, aspect of those things. Now, ladies and gentlemen, although this is the position, uh, there is uh, controversy. Don't forget that controversy that, our, that I have already presented to you, right? Chronic controversy, ladies and gentlemen, seems constitutive of economics requiring reason for some rethinking. Don't forget that. Now, one might simply conclude that uh, scientific realism is not a relevant issue for economics and its philosophy. And uh, one could also conclude that the formulations of scientific realism need to be adjusted so as to bring them closer to the concerns of larger variety of disciplines uh, such as uh, economics. Now, of course, uh, these two uh, are the major options uh, in economics and uh, philosophy of science in economics. And uh, 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 they become obvious as we try to cite some of the representative formulations of scientific realism in the philosophy of science, ladies and gentlemen. Just to take you to the works uh, of uh, Michael uh, David, uh, in 1991 and page 24, uh, he puts his version uh, in primarily ontological terms uh, when he says that uh, according to scientific realism, tokens of most current and observable scientific physical types objectively exist independent of the mental. Don't forget that. Tokens of most current and observable scientific physical types objectively exists independently of the mental. Now, of course, among the troubling elements uh, here in that definition uh, given by David 1991 is that you have issues of the unobservable, unobservable component, uh, issues uh, which are physical, right? And that's why it says tokens of most current an observable scientific, right, physical types. In other words, you have an observable as a concept coming up. Physical is another element, but of course, in his definition towards the end, he talks about independently of the mental. So they exist independently of the mental, ladies and gentlemen. So, meaning that economics does not deal with the entities that are unobservable. Uh, in the same way as paradigm cases in physics are, such as electrons and electromagnetic fields and ions, ladies and gentlemen. So in physics, you'll be talking about those specific things. And yet in economics, you, can talk, you, can, you can't talk about electromagnetic fields and ions. You not talk about electrons and so forth. And therefore, the uh, entities that economics does deal with do not exist independently of the mental, ladies and gentlemen. So I can give you an example. Uh, for example, uh, think of uh, issues that we cover in economics, like preferences and expectations, uh, issues of money and prices, uh, issues of households and business firms. So you'll see that all these issues, preferences, money, households and business farms, etc., they depend on human minds, on human minds for the existence. So there's no you can do away with the human minds, right? And therefore, you cannot say the way David 1991 started, that tokens of most current and observable scientific, right? All these exist independently of the mental. It is not possible, right? Because preferences and expectations, money and prices, households and business farms, they depend on human minds for their existence. And um, this is uh, again supported by the famous Boyd uh, Putnam uh, formulations. Uh, where he suggested, uh, he suggested as part of um, an argument for scientific realism 
that uh, uh, terms in a, a mature science typically refer to the laws of a theory belonging to a mature science, and uh, uh, these are supposed to be typically and approximately true. So meaning that in economics uh, you should be having terms uh, which are probably mature in a science sense, leading to the formulations uh, of a theory, uh, and of course theories belong to a discipline and uh, um, uh, uh, which is uh, mature in nature. So, and certainly when you have laws, and uh, then you have um, uh, uh, those aspects uh, that uh, relate to theories, then you can say that the discipline is certainly very mature. Now, these claims, ladies and gentlemen, that I am discussing uh, right now, are proposed to define scientific realism and are then supposed to provide the best explanation uh, for the uncontroversial predictive and technological success of science. Ladies and gentlemen, if scientific realism were not true, the success of science would be an inexplicable miracle. Right, so it's very important uh, for us to know how we move into this direction. However, in the case of economics, ladies and gentlemen, there is no such similar obvious fact of success to be explained. And uh, this is true uh, because um, uh, it is not very clear uh, whether there is uh, any other sense in which economics might be a mature science uh, whose laws are approximately true and it's also no, uh, not clear whether the Boyd uh, Putnam uh, formulation is relevant to economics. So somebody might actually say that what Boyd Putnam comes up with is not in any way relevant uh, to the discipline of economics. It's up to us uh, during our discourse, our conversation, uh, to justify that kind of thinking or even to dismiss that kind of thinking. So as you can see here, uh, strong epistemological formulations uh, are popular in the philosophy of science, and we know that very well. And it's therefore our responsibility to find what these epistemological formulations uh, in economics are. It is our responsibility. So we don't even just have to suggest that the world is knowable, uh, that justifiable truth about it are attainable, and that uh, scientific realism is taken to make the empirical claim uh, extra, extra. We can't even continue making such statements that we are entitled to believe that many extant theories are true about it. No, we have to interrogate the knowledge, uh, the body of knowledge that exists uh, in this area. And that's why our first lectures centered around the theory of knowledge. And uh, when we are dealing with theory of knowledge, I hope you remember, we are dealing with issues of epistemology, epistemological issues. Epistemological foundations um, are very crucial and very important. So uh, then it's very important for us to continue uh, with that kind of thinking, ladies and gentlemen. So. Uh, let me just remind you something, since many of you have done economics, and I'm sure you appreciate uh, the discipline of economics, and you love it very much. We know that uh, economists are typically very cautious. They are cautious people, and they are very cautious um, in attributing literal truth uh, to their theories and models. Uh, that is quite important, uh, yet they tend to be more relaxed uh, when talking about approximate truth. Right, so when economists come up with their models uh, to try and explain uh, what is happening out there, right, they are very cautious uh, in attributing truth to their theories and models. Uh, you need to mark that, that's quite important. And um, uh, they are always very much prepared to attribute literal falsehood to models and their parts. So during their discussions, uh, when they start talking about this, they figure they've got for poverty 
as measured by this kind of uh, index, etc. They, they go ahead and uh, discuss, but then they say, however, right, uh, because of the uh, errors in this model, because of the falsehoods in this model uh, and the parts of the model, etc., this uh, model may not really work very well. So the weaknesses are always uh, related to the uh, falsehood uh, in their modeling, ladies and gentlemen. So economists are typically very cautious, and that's really an important statement that we need to take up and understand very well. But anyway, whatever beliefs and uh, reasons about the truth of theories, we can always say that individual economists and uh, their groups uh, 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 may uh, not have. Uh, yes. Yes. I've just, just as I've told you before, economists are typically very cautious in attributing literal truth to their theories and models. Uh, while they are far more prepared to attribute uh, literal falsehood to models and their parts, ladies and gentlemen. So as you can see, the above summary that I've just given you suggests that the two options uh, mentioned indeed seek to resolve a real discrepancy between standard formulations of scientific realism and the disciplinary reality of economics, ladies and gentlemen. Do not forget that we are dealing with the issue of realism, and realism is an important uh, aspect in economics. Remember, uh, there are arguments and counter-arguments. There are disputes and counter-disputes. And of course, uh, uh, many refutations have also come to the fore by a group of individuals dismissing uh, economics uh, for its failure to take into consideration uh, reality out there, ladies and gentlemen. Right. Now, of course, as you can see, by taking uh, the, kind, the kind of thinking uh, that we have promoted in this discussion, uh, we see that uh, much of the apparent anti-realism in and about economics is just uh, that, apparently, only, but uh, they do not actually extend their thinking to so many other major aspects that, uh, uh, tend, that may tend to dismiss the discipline, ladies and gentlemen. So that is how far we can go, trying to look at uh, realism in the philosophy of science and uh, relating it to economics, ladies and gentlemen. So at this material time, allow me to go into ingredients of a minimal scientific realism. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, uh, the, uh, uh, the received uh, conception of scientific realism has become an empirical thesis uh, suggesting that good science is justifiably believed to have gotten its theories right. Uh, true, uh, so in other words, as a discipline, you must have theories, right? And these theories must be true, right? Uh, and true about uh, those things which are unobservable and true uh, in the sense that you are able to explain reality out there, ladies and gentlemen. So this is why science, right, is successful because you are able to offer explanations, you are able to predict, uh, and uh, predictions then are at the fore of this important uh, discussion or discourse. Now, in order not to drop economics uh, from the rim of realism, uh, we should still keep our membership in the scientific realist club, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, what the members of the club share uh, certainly is a weaker version of realism, uh, which is minimal scientific realism. And scientific realism should insist, as they have actually done, that uh, being unobservable uh, is not an obstacle to existing uh, in some required realist sense, ladies and gentlemen. So realism is at the forum, and therefore we should continue promoting this kind of 
thinking, ladies and gentlemen. So this is why minimal scientific realism does not include the notion of an observability in this definition uh, of scientific realism, ladies and gentlemen. So it is important for accommodating many scientific disciplines that do not postulate electron-like and observables, because uh, in the field of science, uh, when you, to you begin talking about the structure, uh, for instance, of uh, uh, when you talk about matter, then you get into those aspects of neutrons, uh, protons, and so forth. But in the area of economics, you cannot talk about uh, uh, protons and electrons and so forth. So uh, this is important for accommodating many scientific disciplines that do not uh, postulate, uh, post, uh, postulate uh, electron-like unobservables. So minimal realism in this case should also avoid being specific about the kinds of things that are considered uh, for their existence. And therefore, it should not take a restrictive stance on whether uh, the existence are objects, whether they are properties, whether they are relations, whether they are structures, whether they are uh, processes uh, or events or even powers, etc. Minimal realism is uncommittal in the debates uh, over various versions of ontic structural realism as well as over the issues of dispositional and categorical properties. So, in developing logical versions uh, of realism, then we should try to promote uh, this concept further in economics uh, by trying to uh, incorporate models uh, or design or develop models and theories that are able to define and uh, discuss and promote uh, realism out there, ladies and gentlemen. And that is really very, very important. So scientific realists in this case should insist that many items in the world have a chance of existing mind independently, and that's quite important, and that the existence of electrons that I've already talked about in natural sciences and solar systems, uh, of the existence of mountains and monkeys and so forth, is in no way dependent on the contents of human minds. So what beliefs uh, people have about them, what concepts and theories are held, uh, when talking about them, ETC may have uh, possibly uh, nothing to do with uh, the contents of the human mind. So electrons will always exist, solar systems will always exist, uh, mountains and monkeys, irrespective of what your thinking is. And uh, therefore, uh, in our discipline, that is economics, when you start going into uh, the minds of individuals, what they think, uh, about relationships, about structures, and so forth. So we, we start getting into uh, the mind of an individual, and therefore uh, realism becomes very important. So that's why we need to go out there and construct reality from the outer world and try to offer explanations instead of really coming up with the, uh, those fixed models, right, that may not be able to bring out uh, those realistic aspects, ladies and gentlemen. So it's important. And therefore, uh, instead of requiring that an item examined or postulated by science exists, it is enough to suppose that there's a chance that uh, the item exists. So another way of putting this is to say that there is a fact uh, of the matter as to whether an item does or does not exist uh, uh, science uh, independently. So nothing more is required by minimal scientific realism, ladies and gentlemen. So this implies that one can be a realist about items that are only conjectured to exist, right? Remember, we have conjectures, uh, and I asked you to read uh, the book Conjectures and Refutations by Karl Popper ladies and gentlemen. So conjectures are very important and uh, therefore we need to look at the persistence of behaviors. Uh, but at the end of the day, our objective is to try and find the truth. Remember, we did define uh, knowledge in terms of uh, beliefs, uh, in terms of justification, and in terms of 
truth. So knowledge is justified true belief. And if we have to understand what is happening out there, then realism is at the center of everything. So we must go out and extract reality out there and then try to model that reality. Unfortunately, the traditional economics that we know of has been a little bit slow to try and uh, adapt uh, modern methods of understanding reality uh, from that perspective by modeling it, ladies and gentlemen. But we can also say that for whatever reason, scientists can change their views about the truth of a theory, but this does not imply a chance in its truth. Again, it takes a realistic attitude to have such views as well as to change them. So we need to understand that very well and be able to model those things ladies and gentlemen. So right now, uh, I will uh, take you to, uh, uh, I'll try to revisit that complexity of economics and uh, possibly attempt to uh, move closer uh, towards uh, closing this lecture uh, because um, uh, we need to really uh, come to the close so that next time we discuss other important aspects related to this. Now, I, I did tell you, ladies and gentlemen, at uh, some point that economics is a really a complex subject. Economics deals with the, a complex subject matter and uh, is charged by its critics. You know that very well. To have stuck on misguided tracks of inquiry and erroneous theoretical frameworks. And uh, all those are allegations which have been heaped on economics. But this does not appear to shake the confidence among many economists that uh, they are doing the right thing. And uh, I must also say at this material time uh, that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, do not feel shaken that people are critiquing your discipline. And in fact, the more they critique the discipline, uh, the more the discipline develops and becomes better and better. And then you'll be able to develop models and theories that will approximate reality. Because uh, theories are meant to explain reality out there. And that's why at some stage I told you that a theory can be considered to be a net that you cast out there in the wide environment to capture that kind of reality and then be able to offer explanations to whatever is taking place. So uh, the more we receive these critics in economics, uh, the more we try to develop uh, some kind of uh, theories and models that are realistic and they are able to capture that wider reality out there. So economics is a, uh, a subject, is a subject that deals with the complex issues. And uh, of course, uh, you cannot say it's stuck on misguided tracks of inquiry. Uh, I know that's an allegation hipped on economics and erroneous theoretical frameworks. Uh, so you should not really feel uh, shaken, ladies and gentlemen. So that's why there's confidence on both sides. Uh, uh, on our side uh, that what we are doing is correct and therefore we should continue uh, to uh, push uh, forth uh, our inquiries. So instead of implying a philosophical conflict between a realist and anti-realist interpretation, ladies and gentlemen, we should construe the situation as a scientific conflict between uh, two or more conceptions of whatever uh, or of or what uh, economics has managed to achieve over time. So we should be talking about the successes that economics has brought to the fore. And of course, uh, grounds for confidence vary from discipline to discipline as well as within disciplines. But of course, uh, in our case, we consider that element that I've told you to consider, which is an issue of unobservables. So unobservables uh, are very, very common in economics. We are not dealing with an electron-like uh, type of uh, discipline, but all those things are there. So let me just give you an example as we close, because that example will certainly set in motion and clarify a number of issues. In economics, when we deal with unobservables, Right, we are dealing with the issues of, let's say, households and business firms. Now, whereas households and uh, business firms uh, can be considered to exist out there, 
that there are a number of dynamics within these households that are not really observable, right? When you begin talking about governments and central banks, right, there are so many dynamics. I mean, governments and uh, central banks or a central bank is not really a physical object out there. When you talk about a government, it's not a physical object that you can touch, right? When you talk about uh, prices, right, these are the issue of prices in the mind of the individual, issues of revenues, issues of, let's say, taxes. Uh, I know you can have a rate that is given by governments and so forth, issues of wages, issues of contracts and conventions. Now, of course, you can see these are ordinary items that are recognizable experientially, and this is what distinguishes economics from physics, ladies and gentlemen. So what economics and physics share in common is that they build models that are based on the heavy use of idealizations. So in economics, we've got idealizations. In physics, we've got idealizations. Even in chemistry, the same thing happens, ladies and gentlemen. So, but in this case, uh, these aspects of idealizations, they are usually taken, literally, uh, by some people uh, to capture as a false perspective about the world. So scientific realism faces special challenges in dealing with such falsehood, and it's not very easy, ladies and gentlemen, and that's why in the next section I'll discuss these issues uh, and then consider the issue of independence uh, because these things are really very important, ladies and gentlemen. So, ladies and gentlemen, I, I want to take this opportunity to thank you uh, for attending this lecture, and I want to thank you uh, for being patient and uh, for listening, and I want to invite you to continue reading uh, about issues of realism. So do not forget to read the book that was written by Karl Popper uh, about co uh, conjectures and refutations. Uh, it's only after reading that that we'll be able to really understand what philosophy of science is all about. And uh, do not also forget uh, to discuss and read those things that I gave you, uh, the, those books that I gave you to read at the beginning of this course. So. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, in summary, uh, I will remind you uh, the things that we set out to cover and uh, how far we have gone in this uh, uh, area. I told you I will give you an introduction, I will give you scientific realism in conventional philosophy of science. I also told you that we shall cover ingredients of a minimal scientific realism. Uh, in our next lecture, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we shall continue with the common sensibles and their modifications in economic modeling, and then we shall also go to the social construction and conclude our lecture. Gentlemen, I want to thank you uh, for uh, attending. Uh, I can only say stay well, stay safe, and enjoy your time. Bye.